Hello, everyone. Welcome back for part two of the lecture on the Code of Intellectual Conduct. And I think with the lecture today, um, I was looking it over and thinking about how much time everything was going to take. And I think we're going to have no problems getting through the code uh, in the time I've got for the lecture today. And so I might start talking about the Chapter 2 material, um, which is going to be our first um, block of material proper uh, after getting through this sort of introductory section. And um, there's a lot of big picture stuff we'll get into before we get into uh, the chapter two stuff in particular that's all about uh, really philosophy of language um, and a little it's kind of like linguistics um, but linguistics is more about empirical and contingent features of language as they like differ from different linguistic communities and different natural languages uh, and philosophy of language is a little bit more about the kinds of uh, features of language as such, no matter which particular language we're talking about. So um, the theories we'll be looking at and the kind of analysis that we'll be learning how to do is very transferable regardless of like what language conversation is happening in. So that's the kind of game plan for today. Let's uh, pick up here. Um, I think uh, from the last video we got through <clears throat> principle of charity. And we're going to pick up here on page two. Um, I actually have someone in chat today. So, Kat, if you're uh, wanting to follow along here on the screen that everyone else is going to be seeing on YouTube later, I've got the lecture notes pulled up. Um, but if you want to follow along, um, I'm at the structural principle at the top of page two. Um, and actually, cool. All right. So the structural principle I'm not going to say too much about here because um, this principle is actually the catch-all for everything having to do with formal and informal logic and that's what this class is all about so um, the the actual content or meaning of this principle um, what are the fundamental structural requirements of well-formed arguments as it states in the principle that's what our class is all about and we're going to go into a great amount of detail about what those standards look like and how to execute on them um, but w there's one thing I do want to kind of pick out that I think is somewhat noteworthy here because it, it comes on the heels of the charity principle. So <clears throat> notice the principle says um, arguments that are well formed will not use reasons that contradict each other, that contradict the conclusion, or that explicitly or implicitly assume the truth of the conclusion. Neither does it draw any invalid deductive inferences. So the thing I want to focus on here is that explicitly or implicitly assume the truth of the conclusion. So um, that phenomenon is called, in some times we, we talk about arguing in a circle or circular reasoning, um, but we also use this phrase uh, begging the question uh, or question begging. And this is an interesting um, phrase. <clears throat> first, first off, like people misuse this all the time. Uh, and use the phrase like that begs the question to really mean something like it raises a question um, but question begging and its technical usage means just circular reasoning that basically the argument that's being offered to support a conclusion um, to support a position is taking for granted that the conclusion is already true in trying to make the argument to support it so as a little bit of uh, foreshadowing here for what I'm going to get into with the the lecture starting the chapter two material. Um, <clears throat> what's an argument? And an argument, it, the way we're going to be treating it, the kind of definition we're going to be going with, and I don't think this is a controversial definition, is that an argument is what you've got anytime you have a claim supported by at least one other claim. So at minimum, to have an argument, you need to have two claims a claim that's receiving support or justification or like a rational inference and the claim that's providing that support um, and I'm kind of gesturing with my hands here there's something called standard form which we'll use a lot this quarter and it's a way of diagramming arguments <clears throat> and I, you can kind of imagine I don't have a whiteboard here but you can you can kind of picture it it's very very simple um, you've got like a conclusion claim at the bottom and then a line right above it and then all the premises go on top so premises on top, conclusion at the bottom. And the line indicates that there's an inference happening. On the basis of these premises, you should believe the conclusion. That's what an argument is saying. 
Like um, the way in which we think and talk in very informally in terms of a conclusion following from the premises is a way that we're sensitive to how in the there's in arguments there is this support relation. There's a way in which the the argument strategy here is that if you accept the premises, then you're in a position to accept the conclusion. And I'm I'm being a little vague about that because there are different standards for how to evaluate this, and I'll get into this later in my lecture. Um, but you know, the dream situation for an argument is that the logical connection between the premises and the conclusion is so tight that if someone accepts the premises, they have to accept the conclusion on pain of hypocrisy, right? That they'd have to do that. Okay. So what you've got with question begging is when there's some kind of controversy around the conclusion. Like people are like, I don't know, should I believe that or not? And you're like, here's the reasons why you should believe that. If those reasons that are being provided to support that conclusion only make sense, or only even are true, if the conclusion is true, then it's not really helping us, right? Um, a, a, a common phrase that sort of captures that dynamic would be when we talk about things like preaching to the choir. When you're offering arguments that only people who already agree with your conclusion would be able to rationally accept, that's not helping us. This is very likely to be in a situation of what we might call rationalization. And rationalization is one of my favorite phenomenon to talk about. Uh, it actually is one of the informal fallacies we'll be talking about at the end of the quarter. But we'll be kind of talking about it ubiquitously because the reason why rationalization is such a significant phenomenon is, I think, think back to the last lecture that I gave. As we're sort of, and the way I've been talking about a critical reasoning as a, a, an ethical paradigm or a lifestyle, right? The goal here is that we want reason to, <clears throat> we want the debate, we want the considerations, the rational considerations that we're able to entertain to tell us what we ought to believe, to be sort of guided by the evidence and the argument. Um, we want our uh, belief choices to map onto what makes sense rather than doing it for arbitrary reasons or, or something like that. Um, and so the using reason in a sincere way looks like that. But we often use reason not in that way, not as sincere truth seekers, like think back to the truth seeking principle, but we have ult ulterior motives. And reason, instead of running the show or sort of directing the car, like driving the car, it ends up being just a supporting mechanism um, and that's what rationalization is talking about. When I'm trying to make excuses to justify my position, where I've already decided what I'm going to think, and then I'm just cherry-picking arguments or considerations that support and justify my position, or that I might be able to use to convince you. Um, but I'm not really interested in getting at the truth. I'm not really acknowledging the fallibility principle, that maybe this position is wrong, and I need to be open to that. Um, rationalization is where I've pretty much already made up my mind, for, not for rational reasons, and then I'm just using reason to kind of justify it. And that line between sincere truth-seeking and insincere rationalization um, or excuse-making is a very subtle one. Sometimes it can be really hard to detect which one is which, and to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think we can. I'll turn my hat here on this one. I'm, I don't think we can do this um, well, we definitely can't do it perfectly, but I, I'm pretty pessimistic about our abilities to tell. I'm not sure. When I'm uh, reasoning through things and trying to be a sincere truth seeker to the best of my ability, um, I'm never really sure of, like, what's my real motive here? Like, how, how open-minded am I, you know? Uh, do I have biases that are influencing why I find this argument compelling versus this one. Do I believe this just because I believe it? Or do I have some actual foundations to ground that on um, that are not question begging, that are not just this kind of circular reasoning? So I think that's really hard to detect. And, and even when um, people are trying hard not to do this, we still make these kinds of mistakes. Um, so I, I think modesty is appropriate and understanding with uh, other people. But there, there can be obviously more blatant cases, like cases that seem pretty clearly to be rationalization and other cases that are not. So what can we do about it? 
I don't I don't intend to say like well because we can't have knowledge about it, then who cares or I'm, I don't have that kind of fatalism about my pessimism about our ability to detect sincerity but um, we <clears throat> the reason why I don't have that fatalism about it is because there are things that we can do sorry there's a truck going by I might wait for it to pass uh oh is that our garbage truck? Okay. Cat, how, is there a lot of noise interference going on? Okay, okay. I'm going to keep going then. I'll just be a little distracted. Um, right, that's what I was saying. So, <clears throat> think back to this whole preaching of the choir thing. So, if I'm offering... here, Here's me over here. Uh, my position, my camp of people who think about things the way I do. If I'm only offering reasons that people that already agree with me would accept, think maybe about some political conversations, this happens very frequently, um, then that's not really resolving a rational disagreement. That's probably gonna be rationalization in addition to just being bad logic. The circular reasoning is, just can't be accepted. Um, and here's my opponent over here. The thing I can try to do as an antidote to uh, resisting these forces of rationalization and the tendency for question begging is to reach out <clears throat> and try to find what are neutral considerations that both my opponent and people who agree with me could both accept that would speak in favor of my position. Or, even better, can I reach out to the claims and beliefs of my opponents and show how they actually rationally justify the conclusion I'm defending? That would be even better. But finding neutral reasons or reasons that my opponent already accepts and use that as the material with which to make an argument, those are the kinds of arguments that are going to resist question begging super effectively. So I, I really encourage that. Um, and what is going to help you with doing that sort of thing? Charity is big here. Trying to like understand things from your opponent's perspective uh, is a really key idea. Uh, charity is almost like I might call intellectual empathy. It's like how you can step outside of your shoes and get inside someone else's shoes. One of, one of the reasons why question begging or circular reasoning is so common is, and is because it's just a real natural dynamic of human psychology. Um, the beliefs that I have are not just like a bunch of, uh, I don't know put this, um, like little uh, toys or, or keepsakes or something that I keep away in my attic. <clears throat> They're the things I'm like using every day. Um, I think I might have talked about this with the whole jacket metaphor um, with the fallibility principle. Like I'm, I'm walking around with them and they are the lens through which I understand the world and my experience. And so it's very hard sometimes, like if I'm looking at it from my perspective, what are the things that are going to pop out to me as evidence? They're probably things that are going <laughs> to fit with my perspective. This is like what happens with confirmation bias, if you've ever studied that. So what we have to do is, to avoid question begging, is to like find ways to detach from our perspectives and be like, does this really make sense or not? And that's a really hard thing to do. Um, but charity helps with that. Charity, uh, exerting charity, deploying your intellectual resources to try to brainstorm arguments that would support your opponent's position trains the kind of muscles that I think is helpful here. Uh, and again, like um, I think I said at the beginning of the last lecture that one other name for things like the Code of Intellectual Conduct is a listing of the intellectual virtues. And I, I like that term too as a way to describe what's going on here. Um, because virtues implies a character trait or like a skill that you can develop and get stronger with. And it's not just like you've got this thing or you don't. We have it to degrees. Um, our charity muscle might be relatively stronger or weaker. Um, <clears throat> our ability to detach from some of our beliefs might be, it might be easy for us to do it. With other of our beliefs, it might be harder to do that. Um, so it's always kind of on a spectrum. And there's always room for improve, improvement. And th this is part of something I said, I think, in the very first video, the welcome video, about how the skills that we're trying to learn in this class are not things you're going to pick up in seven weeks of a summer quarter, or even 11 weeks of a normal quarter. Um, it's it's uh, it's skills, lifelong skills that you'll be developing forever. So, 
So that's what I have to say. I guess I did have quite a lot to say about structural principle, but there's even more and, and way more that we'll be getting into throughout the rest of the quarter. As opposed to my other classes where I use the code, you in this class are going to get a very robust picture of what the structural principle is really asking for. And there's quite a lot going on there. Um, Kat, can I just check in with you? How are things going? Uh, do you have any questions popped up for you? Okay, cool. Um, I will probably check in with you again. It's I'm it's I'm tickled that there's anyone here at all. <laughs> okay, um, the next two principles I want to talk about relevance. Um, and sufficiency, I'm going to do those together. I'm going to skip the acceptability principle here for a second. Um, and actually, I want to do this. There, now my webcam video is still up. Okay. So uh, relevance is saying that um, when you're having a debate about um, some rational controversy, trying to sort it out, um, you want to make sure that your contributions are on topic, that they're on task, so to speak. Um, but it, it's not just a matter of like not drifting away. Like sometimes when you have debates and discussions with people, it just gets really messy because you're like bouncing around from tangent to tangent. I love tangents. I will go on lots of tangents in my lectures. Um, sometimes <coughs> it takes some discipline for me to avoid that. <coughs> um, But sometimes it can feel really unproductive. <coughs> Pardon me. Got this frog in my throat again. Um, it can feel very unproductive because we're not staying in one spot long enough to really get some work done on it. And our minds, like, they drift. We've got um, loose association going on, and this makes me think of that, and that makes me think of that. And a little bit of discipline here, a little bit of... Um, focus on the topic at hand is, is part of what relevance is telling us about. But that even wouldn't be, you know, such a big deal. Like, stay on topic, sure, fine. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm going to pause the video. Sorry, everyone. <coughs> I think I inhaled a bug. That's what it sure felt like. Felt like someone was squirming in there. Maybe a fly or something. Whew. All right. Um, I think I'm okay. Where was I? Um, right. So staying on topic, this is a fine enough recommendation. But uh, we, we might want something a little uh, more substantive. And the relevance principle gives us that. Uh, it tells us what would count as relevant. And let me show you here. It says, um, one who presents an argument for or against a position should set forth only reasons whose truth provides some evidence for the truth of the conclusion. So that's giving us something more substantive to work with here. It's telling us that any considerations that don't actually affect the truth of the conclusion, or maybe is a, a, affects it in a negative way, like is a possible objection, is really doesn't belong in the conversation. And there's so much stuff that comes up that might not be relevant. The most common one is... Uh, a, a fallacy that we call the ad hominem fallacy, attacking people. Personal attacks, they're not just unethical and abusive, um, like name calling and <clears throat> all that kind of stuff, but they're actually irrelevant. If someone offers an argument and throws it down on the table, to attack them doesn't deal with their ideas at all. Like, even I, I like to joke sometimes that sometimes the most frustrating thing about assholes is that they're right, that they might, we might not like them personally, but they can have good ideas or good arguments. And for us to say, because I don't like you, I'm not going to accept your argument, that's not what a truth seeker would do. That's not very logical. Accepting their argument doesn't mean you have to like them. <laughs> that's the other way. It's like, just because someone has good arguments doesn't mean that they're like a good person or that they've given those arguments in a proper way. There could be other things going on. But that whole um, phrase maybe you've heard before of like, it's not offensive if it's true. I'm like, ah, that's not the case. <laughs> like, it can be both, right? Um, Kat has a question here. Um, in terms of debates and arguments and trying to bring your opponent to your conclusion with the facts, 
implied do they have to be true uh, is this something you try to persuade with your own personal reasonings um, this is a very relevant question for what we're talking about with relevance um, what does personal experience count for in a debate in a rational debate about trying to figure out what's true it sometimes can do a lot I mean what is not part of our personal experiences um, every even all the stuff that we do with science is based ultimately on sense perception which is something we consciously have contact with even if I've got a, a Geiger counter or some kind of instrument I still need to be observing the instrument to see what it's telling me right um, <clears throat> so I think it becomes very hard to like draw a line about that in as a categorical one but there are cases in which um, personal anecdotal evidence is very thin and doesn't actually weigh for as much um, and we'll talk about this with some of the standards to come uh, in the rest of the quarter but there's um, <clears throat> some of what your your question reminds me of cat is um, the fact opinion distinction is that at all like happening in the background for you cat you thinking about the fact opinion distinction yeah okay um this is kind of a little thing i have a axe to grind about I, I i don't know why this distinction gets taught so much and i think it, it gets grossly misinterpreted a whole lot um <clears throat> what is an opinion well an opinion is just having a belief if you have a belief you have an opinion that's it what is a fact we might want to say it's something that's not just an opinion as if opinions are just opinions, right, and nothing more. But all opinions are opinions about what is true or what is good. So claims, I, I can turn my hat for this part. Um, all claims that we ever make go into two kind of, they come in two flavors. There are descriptive claims and there are normative claims. And descriptive claims are about how things are. Normative claims are about how they ought to be. And probably the most common thing I've seen with the application of the fact opinion distinction is that truths about how things are, those are facts. But claims about <clears throat> opinions about what is good or bad or right and wrong, what ought to happen, this normative stuff, um, that's opinion and just opinion. But the first thing I'd say is, first of all, you can have opinions about descriptive matters. This happens all the time. And even when it's not been settled, you can there are controversial opinions about descriptive matters. Physicists don't all agree about what's the right way to think about reality, especially with some very high-profile discussions in physics today, say about like string theory um, and some stuff with quantum mechanics. They don't all see eye to eye about that stuff. Um, and so they have opinions. Scientists have opinions about things that are objective, right? And on the level of <clears throat> normative stuff, moral stuff, um, people, philosophers talk about there being moral facts all the time. And there are some people who don't believe moral facts exist, um, but there's some good reasons for thinking that that can happen too. That it's not pure subjective opinion. <clears throat> we might talk a little bit about relativism here sooner or later, but um, relativism is a philosophical stance about the nature of truth in saying that truth is just whatever you believe. So everyone has their own truth, and there is no objective universal truth. Um, a standpoint of uh, like a, a vision like the code of intellectual conduct or critical reasoning generally is itself taking a philosophical stand against relativism. It's not to discredit people's personal experiences, but to say that there's <clears throat> a truth that's independent of just what you believe. If relativism is true, if something is true just in virtue of you believing it, then there's no way you could ever be wrong. Everything you believe is right. Because as soon as you believe it, it's your truth. And the fact that there's no opportunity to be wrong is one of the biggest blows against something like relativism. And why something like the Code of Intellectual Conduct or any standard of critical reasoning whatsoever is going to reject relativism is because it's providing standards of accountability about how we could make mistakes with this or we could believe the wrong thing or have false beliefs. Those things can happen. Um, so that's a little bit of my axe grinding here about, about this. Um, <clears throat> I actually... I. 
I usually try to avoid doing something I've seen a lot of other philosophers, that a lot of philosophy instructors I've had do with relativism, which is like just dismiss it as absurd and then phew, go away. Um, <clears throat> or like try to come in in the first day and like beat the relativism out of all their students and then we can move on and get to work here. But there is a, a sort of reason why many instructors have that kind of approach and that's because if relativism is right, then w this class is worthless. We might as well just go, see ya. Like there's nothing for us to do if we can't be wrong. Um, and that doesn't seem to be what's going on. As Plato puts it uh, in a dialogue, uh, the Theotetus, um, many centuries ago, he says, if in times of trouble and crisis, if at no other time, you see people adopt this view, that they turn to one another as if to gods, because they treat them as being superior in precisely this thing, knowledge. That's almost a direct quote. <clears throat> I'm getting better about that. Um, but what he's saying is that even if under other circumstances we might be like, yep, you've got your truth, but I've got my truth, and we're kind of like operating in a relativistic way, when the chips are down and the shit hits the fan, we're like, no, I can be wrong, and I'm going to defer to someone else's opinion um, because I don't think that my perspective or my truth is really what is actually true when there's some kind of stakes involved. Um, but so I, I don't like to just dismiss relativism right out of hand. In my 101 class, uh, I'm going to be, we're going to be talking about this for weeks, actually. It's going to be a theme throughout the course um, to try to take it seriously. And, I, and I'm guessing, I'm almost certain that there's some of you in this class that have at least some relativistic sympathies. And there's a lot of things about it that are somewhat compelling. And while I personally think relativism is wrong, um, and or not just personally, but I have philosophical reasons for thinking that this is not the most rationally defensible way to understand truth. Um, I do think that there are some things that sometimes get missed about what motivates relativists that's at least potentially legitimate. There's some pretty illegitimate reasons for being a relativist, like it just sort of justifies intellectual laziness <laughs> because if, if everyone just always has their truth and there isn't the truth out there, then I don't have to be a truth seeker, right? I don't have to do all that work. But I think there are some legitimate reasons too, like people concerned ab about values of tolerance um, or epistemic modesty, which is a big deal for me, epistemic modesty, given some of my other philosophical positions, um, and just this way in which uh, we observe a kind of, um, and not everyone believes this, but um, something I've seen very often and, and I'm sympathetic with, is that all of our efforts at getting at truth or to reason about things seem really subjective. That uh, we're kind of like in a subjective bubble that we can't ever escape. That we can't see things as they really are. Like that there's some pri privileged perspective from which to view these matters that's going to just show things in, as the unvarnished truth. It's like everything is interpreted. Every, all of our thoughts about reality happen through subjective filters. Um, if you're thinking that way about it, <clears throat> and you want to talk about this more, this is a tangent I'm not going to pursue further in the lecture right now, um, but there's a lot to say about it, and I love this debate. It's one of my favorite debates in the whole world of philosophy. Um, definitely one of these things that we could do for, like, bonus points or something. Not, not in the technical sense for your grade, but if you want to get more out of this class, uh, this is the kind of conversation I'd love to have with you. Um, but there's there are ways that you can... Um, reject relativism and still endorse this view like uh, all reality is interpreted reality or it's all subjective. There's a position called subjectivism which thinks exactly that. Which thinks uh, truth is something subjective, it's stance dependent, that truth depends on how you're looking, but that there still is room for objective and universal truth. And the relativist says Truth is stance dependent, it depends on how you're looking, and because of that, there is no universal objective truth. So that's the point of disagreement between relativists and subjectivists. Um, but that subjectivist position is oftentimes overlooked as an alternative here between there's objective truth and it's out there versus truth is something about us and there is no objective truth. <clears throat> I have one final thing. I know we've been talking a lot about the relevance principle here, but there's one other tangent that this principle affords me the opportunity to talk about, which I definitely want to get to. 
Um, and this is also connected with your question, Kat. Like, really directly, I think. Um, what's the role here for personal reasoning or stuff that's that's very, you know, sort of about me and my subjectivity? And that's emotions. So um, there's a bunch of different positions that float around out there. And I, actually, I should probably turn my hat for this one, too, because uh, figuring out what role emotions ought to play in rational debate is a very tricky question. And there's a lot of controversy about this. There isn't some kind of universal answer that every philosopher is going to tell you or something like that. But I have my own um, proposal to give you, my own best effort about how to balance this, not just philosophically, but personally. Because philosophers are humans, right? And we have to figure out what's our relationship with this truth-seeking thing plus you know, what's going on inside. So maybe it's this apple juice that's like messing with my throat. Maybe I should get some water. I think I'm going to do that. One pause, and I'll come back and then talk about emotions. All right, that's better. Um, so emotions. So what role should they play? Um, the proposal I want to offer is kind of a <clears throat> hybrid one. It's a, it's a balancing act kind of answer that I want to provide. But I want to give some guidance about in what way. But one concern, or one, one way of answering that question I see very frequently is that it's, it's sort of a policy of check your emotions at the door. When you're going to enter into some rational debate about something, you just got to check your emotions. You know, you got to set aside your baggage about that, your biases, and just look at the evidence and the ideas and the logic of it, and that's it. And the reason why... Um, I think people are motivated to give that sort of answer is because they recognize how emotions have a biasing effect on our thinking. That they can, um, they can influence our belief formation in a way that, doesn't, that isn't responsive to argument or evidence. And that's part of the concern about it. And also recognizing that the emotion itself is very suspect as a basis of evidence itself, right? But like, the fact that I feel strongly about a belief doesn't make it more likely to be true. And there's lots of counterexamples about this, um, about how we can have very strong convictions about things that are absolutely wrong, and how they, those convictions keep us from being able to maybe entertain fallibility, um, to rethink those positions and perspectives. So there's some real concerns there about, I, I think, the legitimate concerns about um, how emotions could be used in a debate. Um, also, when they're sort of treated as evidence, then you get into really wacky behavioral uh, patterns in, de in context of debate. Like the most common one <clears throat> you might be thinking of is the shouting match. That if emotion is evidence for truth, then if you want to win the debate, you're, you just need to sort of demonstrate that your emotional commitments are stronger or deeper than those of your opponent. And so that escalates, right, of how, you know, wild people are getting with their emotional expressions. <clears throat> the other problem, and we have a fallacy listed for this, is just manipulation of emotions. That you can do all sorts of coercive tricks to get someone to side with your position in a way that seems illegitimate. Um, <clears throat> But there, we're going to have to comp, uh, qualify that manipulation of emotions thing a little bit. So that's, that's the side that's sort of what, what we're up against in terms of defending a role for emotions in debate. Um, I, I share some of those uh, concerns. I'm sympathetic with them. And so I, part of my proposal is to not treat um, emotions as direct evidence themselves. But to say that they don't, they don't have any role to play in the debate seems inhuman to me, but not just that, but irrational. That we're basically, if we check all of our emotions at the door, and we don't, we, we discredit them, we don't engage with them whatsoever as a part of our truth-seeking efforts, that we're missing out on huge uh, amounts of material that could be very relevant to our truth-seeking efforts. But how to make sense of that? How would they not be evidence and yet play some sort of role in evidence or argument. And that's where I propose this model of a lead. So I'm going to tell a little story here. Um, 
imagine you are a um, a uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, police investigator, detective. That was the word I was looking for. Police investigator. <coughs> you're a detective, and one night you're working late. You get a phone call. And it's like an anonymous tip, like, you should check out this person, they're the murderer. And you think to yourself, and then it's click, hang up. And you're like, okay, well, can I use that in court? Can I use that anonymous phone tip in court? I get on the stand, you know, and they're like, so what did your investigations reveal, officer? And I'm like, well, I got an anonymous phone tip that that person did it, so they did. Like, that's not going to fly. That's not admissible evidence in, in a court. But for me to say, well, I can't use this in the court case, so I'm just going to forget about it, would be like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Negligent. Um, I would be uh, not, I would, it would be a dereliction of duty for me to do this. Um, what, if, what is my responsibility? Well, I can't use that anonymous tip as evidence, but maybe it's a lead that I need to follow up on and pursue because it might yield evidence. And this is how I kind of think about my emotions and emotions generally. That they, um, thinking about them more philosophically here, and from my background with cognitive science, what emotions do is direct attention. They uh, create salience effects. The same way that if you like hear a loud noise, you're like, what? Or you see a flash. Or if you're in a crowded room, you'll hear your name. Like you'll be like, wah, 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 Tim. Wah, wah, wah. And you're like, whoa, someone just said my name, right? There's certain things that have salience that, that our attention is drawn to. And emotions create salience effects. Um, they direct our attention towards things, sometimes like to a very extreme degree, like approaching obsession and things like that. Um, but they direct our attention. So they are not themselves the evidence, but they kind of might point at some. And sometimes when you follow up on leads, they amount to nothing. Nothing of real rational or evidential weight is there. But sometimes they do have something. And I just say from personal experience doing this and from talking with many other people and kind of using emotions in debate, I've seen this really work out to great effect. Sometimes when I'm like, my emotions are like, over here, over here, over here, you need to look over here. And then I look over there and I'm like, what's going on here? Oh, it's my pride or my ego. That's what's going on. That's what you're complaining about emotion. Okay, my pride and my ego, that's not relevant to the argument. That's not something like in the sense of the relevance principle that contributes some evidence to the truth of the conclusion or something like that. But other times when I follow up on my emotions, they're like getting my attention at something that I'm like, oh, this is pretty significant, right? There's, there is something going on here, um, especially in moral reflection, I find this. Um, our moral sentiments direct us to facets of a situation that I that might be extremely morally relevant in deciding how to evaluate that situation. Um, so the the other thing we I, I could say about emotions from a kind of philosophical point of view is that emotions don't tell you exactly what they're saying. Sometimes the, those salience effects are pretty obvious, like it's a very clear object that they're directing directing attention to. But oftentimes it's like a loose gesture, right? Like maybe you wake up in the morning and you just feel like, Ugh, just feel, Ugh. or you're just like, I'm feeling great. Like, and you're like, why am I feeling so bad? Or why am I feeling so good? It's like not clear. Or you encounter a situation and you walk away from it and be like, Ugh, something was up about that. But I, I don't know. It's not like the emotion tells you like, this person is doing this immoral thing right there. You're just like, this kind of feels icky, right? So you have to interpret emotions too. There's a, a rational component of being able to get them to yield any argument that there's some extra work to put in there. And that's kind of what I have in mind with this following up on the lead thing. So I, I kind of, um, as, a, as a practical procedure here, when I'm reflecting on something critically, or I'm in a debate with someone, and emotions are coming up, um, I try to first listen to them. I don't try to repress them or shove them away. Um, I try to listen to them kind of in a friendly way. Like, I'm like, what do you got to say, emotion? Like, I'm, I'm listening here. What do you got? And they're like, look over here. And then I follow up on that. And then I'd be like, what's up? What's going on over here? Can I notice? And then once the emotion gets me to look in a certain place, then I'm like, thanks for your help, emotion. I can take it from here. 
And there, there's that kind of detachment thing that I think is helpful too. And that's a pretty tricky step. Sometimes we can't do that very effectively. Um, and there, I think there's, like I've said before, there's limits to critical thinking. The, the tool set is not always the right tool for the job. And sometimes there's some limits. And some of that has to do with our emotional experiences. Um, sometimes something we may not have the bandwidth to be able to do this kind of proposal that I'm making. But um, if it's possible, I think this is a pretty ideal way to go. But try to detach from the emotion. Like once it's done its job in directing you someplace, then it shouldn't be kind of clouding or influencing how that is being evaluated, I, th I think. Um, other people disagree with me about this for sure. I got in a big debate with one of my colleagues uh, a couple weeks ago about this. Um, but I, I think once you're there, then you look at this and be like, what, what's going on here? Like trying to, to sift through whatever the emotion has directed your attention to, to be like, what could maybe work? Like now I'm starting to use my intellectual, rational imagination for, is there anything out of this raw material that would speak legitimately to the truth or falsity of the claim in question, the debate that we're having, things like that. Um, so I think that kind of even-handed approach is not only helpful for truth-seeking purposes, but is also, I would dare I say, emotionally healthy. I think it's good to have um, a friendly relationship with your own emotional experiences, even when you don't like them. Um, sometimes even the emotions that we'd rather not be having can be insightful. They can direct our attention to something that needs attention. Um, and I think the practice of listening to emotions makes it easier to detach from them. I'm, a, I'm also a Buddhist, I might have mentioned that. Um, so detachment is uh, something else I think of as good. I mean, if we want to get deeper on that rabbit hole, we could outside of class if you ever want to talk to me about that. Um, but I think this gives you the picture and um, for what I'd want to say about how to integrate emotions into debate. And, and I, I'm bringing it up as part of the relevance principle because there's a concern. Are, are emotions relevant? And my answer is not a clear yes or no but that there's a way in which they can be relevant. And here's the way that we should proceed in context of debate that give it that chance um, and that we don't miss those opportunities. Um, Kat, as my canary in the coal mine, how is this, how's this going? Is, is at least my proposal uh, intelligible, making sense? Cool, awesome. Any, any uh, feedback or criticisms you wanna share? Okay, didn't mean to put you on the spot about that either, but I just thought I'd check in. Okay, um, the next principle that I was saying go, kind of goes hand in hand with, with relevance is sufficiency. And maybe I've been saying this already and then speaking forever, but I don't have too much to say about sufficiency um, other than that if you imagine a debate as like a tennis match, right, you're like hitting the ball over the net and now it's in their court and they hit it back into your court and that sort of thing. Sufficiency is just a reminder that even if you said something relevant that's on topic and that actually contributes some evidence, um, that means you've not missed the ball, you've hit the ball, and you've hit it in the right direction. Um, it's headed toward the opponent's court. Um, you may not have hit that hard enough or effectively enough for the ball to really have traveled back into their court. So the most simple way I can put this is that the sufficiency principle is reminding us that just because we have something to say doesn't mean that we have effectively shouldered our burden of proof or um, responded to an objection and defeated it. A lot of times, especially when we're doing debate in an oral uh, format, that's like, I say something, you say something, I say something, you say something, you've got an objection to my position, and then I've got something to say back it may not have been sufficient to deal with what you said. It's not like the onus is back on you again. Um, and that's all I really wanted to say about sufficiency. It's very connected with relevance. And in fact, you can see it from the language itself. Um, it says here, uh, one who presents an argument for or against a position should attempt to provide relevant and acceptable reasons of the right kind, which is really what the relevance principle, the right kind is stuff that uh, reasons whose truth provides some evidence for the truth of the conclusion that together are sufficient in number and weight to justify the acceptance of the conclusion. So very connected with relevance. The only thing I'd really want to add maybe to that is that um, it's just a note that what is a sufficient reason is oftentimes one of the things that is rationally controversial that we don't necessarily see eye to eye about. So keep that in mind. What you think of as an effective response may not satisfy your conversational partner. They might be like, 
that's not enough, right? I was having a big debate with an old student last night on the phone. Um, we talked for probably two hours, and uh, they they love debating, um, and they like debating about political matters. And I won't tell you exactly what the content was, uh, but it was um, he he likes to have hot takes. I'll put it that way. And uh, a lot of times he would give an argument and. And then he would be silent, like expecting my response, and I would just be like, "That's not enough for for me to go on." Like I can see what you're trying to do as presenting evidence in support of this position, um, but it's just not enough. It's like, and that's where like anecdotal evidence can just oftentimes be relevant, but not sufficient. Um, one person's experience, one time, not enough. One person's actions is not enough to speak about their overall character. You kind of need to take a broader view of it, right? Of like all of their actions to see whether that one case is enough. Um, but uh, one, the, thing, uh, the other thing to say about sufficiency is that depending on the strength of the conclusion, something might be sufficient. So uh, in our, the like premises conclusion, right? The stronger your conclusion, the greater burden of proof you have to support it. Like the, the stronger your premises need to be to be adequately and sufficiently supporting that conclusion. So one of the things that anecdotal evidence is really good for is just proving that something is possible. If it's happened once, it's possible. Right? We know it can happen. But if you want to say something like a little bit more, a little stronger than just it's possible, like maybe it's likely, well then an anecdotal case is probably insufficient. So. Sometimes it's just a matter of the right tool for the job. Uh, and depending on the target, a certain argument might be sufficient or insufficient. We'll talk a lot more about that in the chapter three material when we talk about this argumentative maneuver called guarding. Talk a lot more about strength of claims. Okay, um, I think I want to uh, take a little break here in the middle of the lecture. Um, this is actually going a little slower than I thought uh, it would. Um, so we'll see how much time we got, but we're definitely going to be able to get through the code. We got three more principles, and I don't think it's going to take us an hour to do that. Um, uh, but uh, we got into some good good tangents here. Okay, so we'll take a little break. All right, getting back into it. So the next principle on the code, we got three more principles to talk about, and the next one, the acceptability principle, is one that I'm actually this is probably the most drastic recommendation that I've got for how to how I would adjust the code um, or propose to do that and that's to cut this principle entirely <laughs> I don't I don't like this one I don't think it's very useful I, I think it has limited usefulness but under many circumstances it's inappropriate um, and I'll, I'll try to make the case for that and uh, maybe I keep my hat turned on this one um, but let's take a look at it it also is the wordiest of all the principles on the code of intellectual conduct which is kind of interesting um, but let's uh, let's get that up. Um, so what do we got here? We have uh, the the acceptability principle says one who presents an argument for or against a position should provide reasons that are likely to be accepted by a mature, rational person, and that meet standard criteria of acceptability. Now I don't know about you, but if you're like me, there's already some alarm bells going off with this phrase "mature, rational person" because I'm like who is that and how can we define this in a way that's not question begging um, and that's the big concern the question begging aspect here now those list of numbered points here um, are the first set of seven are things that do positively meet the criteria of acceptability so it's cashing out what that is the next five after that are examples of things that fail to meet the standard criteria of acceptability now, I've, I'm assuming that most of you in this class have not taken any philosophy before. Maybe some of you have. Um, if you have taken some philosophy before, then this might this list might also like set off some alarm bells because if if we are really using this criteria of acceptability, there are a lot of philosophers and important ones, ones that seem to be adding very important things to the conversation about truth seeking, that would be filtered out. And that's effectively what the acceptability principle is. It's a filter. So imagine we're at this like table of the debate like I was talking about in my last lecture. Um, we come to the table and we've got things we might want to, you know, we've got in our bags, arguments, evidence, that we want to put out on the table of the debate. The acceptability principle is like putting this filter up 
about what stuff should be put on that table and what stuff should not. And uh, so I'm concerned about some things getting filtered out here that we really would want to have included in the conversation. And I'm going to put this in a kind of blunt way, um, a very informal way, uh, but the the kinds of things that are, or the, the perspectives that are getting weeded out are like the crazy perspectives. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all, although the acceptability principle does, and that's part of my problem with it. But just the stuff that's really counterintuitive, um, that doesn't fit with common sense um, that is out there right that's that's off the beaten path that's coming from left field that subverts a lot of our expectations about what we might think counts as rational um, but sometimes those things have really good arguments to support them and they're not the ones that we normally consider so what this is kind of doing is weeding the crazies out and um, I, I like them. <laughs> I sometimes am one. <laughs> so there's kind of a personal thing here too in, in, my, um, in, my, in my own journeys as a professional philosopher. Sometimes I've been the person in the room who wants to advocate and argue for a perspective that otherwise everyone else in the room doesn't think has any legs to it whatsoever. So why would it be valuable? Uh, so the, the question begging concern is big. If they're not even allowed in the debate, then we can't even figure out whether we're not going to be in a position to weigh whether there's some merit there. So it might be prejudging that those views are wrong. I was saying in the last video how when we were talking about the ethical um, standard for the code itself, the big, the big picture standard before we got into any of the principles, um, I was like, Edward Damer's showing some pretty reasonable um, modesty and conservativeness here in not cashing out that ethical term because he doesn't want to prejudge the code against uh, those kinds of ethical views that we're interested in debating that might be part of the controversy that debate is supposed to help us resolve. I wish it was happening here. <laughs> I wish that same conservativeness was on display here. Um, the acceptability principle by setting up those principles of what counts and what doesn't count is prejudging that those are proper rational standards. And like I said, there's a lot of people in the history of philosophy that would challenge those things as being um, as straightforwardly the right way we should think about epistemic matters, matters of knowledge uh, or not. Um, so that, that, that's one of my big concerns is a question begging thing. But I can make pos more positive arguments here too. There's two big reasons why I think letting in crazy perspectives or things that are off the beaten path is something very valuable. For one, sometimes they're right. And the history of philosophy, the history of science bears this out. That sometimes the views that didn't fit with the kinds of stuff that's on the criteria of acceptability, um, when people actually started taking them seriously and looking at what they had to offer and how much water they can hold, they're like, those actually were good. And if we weren't willing to entertain them in the first place, then we'd miss out on all that insight. So sometimes those views are right. Like that's how I'm like, sometimes I'm the person who's got the crazy view that's in the room. Um, and I think that, that, that sometimes those views that can be ultimately the most rationally defensible. But we have to let them have a shot rather than filtering them out before they even get on the table of the debate. Let the debate sort that out is really my recommendation. But there's a second reason. Um, and the second reason is that even if they're wrong, it can be really valuable to engage with them. And I've got some personal examples I can give as illustrations here. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say they should be used as evidence because that would be anecdotal reasoning, but, um, but they at least demonstrate what's possible here. Um, there's, uh, there's one philosopher that I've spent a lot of time with in my studies that I like disagree with on so many matters, especially when it comes to his conclusions. Um, some of his observations, I think, are astute, but what he does with them argumentatively, I'm like, nope. And that would be Nietzsche. And I don't know how many of you have ever had some contact with Nietzsche, um, but he is out there. He is way off the beaten path and says a lot of things that we might find really counterintuitive and, and just kind of not just wrong, but like from my perspective, um, monstrous, 
Like, uh, Nietzsche is a hardcore anti-egalitarian. He does not think that all people have equal moral worth, um, that they are like something like human rights theory. Um, from, from Nietzsche's view, he's like, um, people are shit. They're not worth anything. He doesn't care about justice at all. In fact, he says um, if someone has a great purpose, then uh, they are superior to justice, so they don't need to base. They basically don't need to care. Don't let justice get in the way of ambition. Is something Nietzsche holds. Uh, I don't agree with that uh, at all. Um, I do think that human rights exist and that everyone has them and has them equally. Um, we could have debates about egalitarianism sometime if you want. I mean, egalitarianism sometimes gets misunderstood. It's not saying everyone is equal in every respect. It's saying everyone is equal when it comes to their moral worth, of their deservedness of care and concern. Um, and I think that that's right. But Nietzsche is a hardcore elitist about this. He thinks that maybe only a handful of people uh, in the history of humanity are actually worth anything at all. Um, so I really disagree with him about a great number of things. He hates Christianity. I'm a Christian. He hates Eastern philosophy like Buddhism. I love Buddhism. I mean, there's a lot of things that I disagree with him about. But I've spent a ton of time with him. And the reason is not that I think he's going to actually convince me that I'm wrong or something like that. I'm, I, you know, I engage with him with the fallibility principle, but reasonably, I don't think he's going to be able to convince me that justice doesn't matter or something like that, or that universal compassion is uh, absurd or, or something like that. But in looking at him, he offers a lot of arguments and challenges that you don't usually hear that are, uh, nowadays there's some people who I think fancy themselves as being like Nietzsche, but they're not, they don't have his genius. Um, and usually their arguments are m much sillier and much more easily defeated. And Nietzsche does have some philosophical brilliance to him in, in my estimation. Uh, I think he is a very astute observer of human nature. Um, and he just, he's challenging things in a way that you don't usually get. And he has proven so helpful to me in my own philosophical journeys and my own understanding of the perspectives that I do have conviction in. Because by challenging me, he, I now have to respond to his arguments. And if, we, if I was just like, ah, that's nuts, I'm not going to think about that at all, I'm not going to engage with that, I'm not going to read that stuff, I'm not going to talk to this person, then I miss out on that. Um, the good thing about these views is that they challenge the things that we take for granted as being obvious. When we actually have to articulate a defense that meets those objections, we learn so much more about why we believe what we believe. And I, in my opinion, I think that can matter sometimes even more, or at least as much, if not more, than what we believe. And if this was my ethics class, I'd be making a really big deal about this, because I think that definitely ha is at the forefront when it comes to ethics, that why we endorse a set of values or why we think a behavior is right or wrong can matter more than just what behaviors we think are right and wrong. Um, so, but that goes for even non-ethical subjects as well. Um, we, when we have to defend ourselves, this kind of necessity is the mother of invention phenomenon, um, we can gain deeper insight about just why something is right. If you have, uh, like say, stubborn convictions about certain beliefs, um, that you don't think reflectively about, you're actually, your stubbornness is fairly weak, in my opinion, because all it's going to take is a couple arguments thrown your way, and then you're like, oh, shoot, I don't I got nothing to say against that, right? <laughs> I'm like, you might, you might actually give them up. Um, but if you actually think really critically about this and face off against those opponents, you can learn about, like, not just that I have conviction in something, but that it is justified to have conviction. And that's a deeper kind of conviction. This is rational conviction rather than just dogmatism and stubbornness. And that's much more powerful. So especially with values like egalitarian values, like human rights, um, universal compassion, tolerance, uh, the value on diversity, sometimes these values, which I, I share all those values um, and a ton of others, <laughs> but those, there's a lot of values that get bandied about today that I think of as good, but sometimes they get talked about in pretty superficial ways. Like, of course this is good, and anyone who doesn't think these things are good is nuts, right? Is like, 
ha is wrong, is evil, right, and just dismissed. And I think engaging with the people that disagree with us and taking them seriously with charity as much as possible, it's not just a matter of whether certain beliefs are going to be changed or not, but it's a matter of the basis on which we ground those beliefs. Um, I mean, just as a, a sort of testimonial, um, with my upbringing and my life experience, um, tolerance is a value that's sort of been a part of my life for a long time. But then when I was younger, I did encounter some voices who were like, yeah, tolerance is kind of a dumb value. Like, it, like this kind of goes back to some of the stuff about uh, uh, like open-mindedness getting in the way of, or the, the ethical concerns about respecting people as getting in the way of the critical truth-seeking project. I heard some of those arguments. And for a little brief time, I was like, oh, yeah, maybe tolerance doesn't matter. Maybe it, it's really... They just like the PC stuff, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just a big show. It doesn't have the substance. Uh, it's not caring about the truth, all this critical stuff, right? It's just like this loosey-goosey, like, eh, whatever kind of thing. And for a little bit of time, I was like, maybe that's right. But then I thought more about it, and I, I actually tried to be like, well, okay, like what arguments can be made to defend the value of tolerance against those kinds of objections? And I was like, there's a lot. <laughs> so now, like, the the roots are deeper, right? Um, now that I've had to confront that kind of opponent and give arguments that defeat those sorts of objections, now my commitment to tolerance goes much deeper. And it's helpful in the sense that it also maybe uh, corrects against um, bad ways of holding those beliefs or positions or values or whatever. Um, that's especially true with, going back to Nietzsche as an example, uh, with my... Um, religious and spiritual beliefs. So one of the things I, I've always told to other people who are religious and thinking about philosophy and concerned about uh, atheism and uh, the, the secular nature of philosophy is that there's a lot it can offer. Even it's like harshest opponents like Nietzsche who just think this dumbest thing in the universe um, are useful at correcting those versions of say Eastern philosophy like Buddhism or a Western religious tradition like Christianity but like the bad versions of it, the ones that are rightfully objectionable. It's just that there's other versions that aren't, that can like uh, get around those kinds of objections or don't have those kinds of problems. So that's a little bit of a demonstration here of why I think the acceptability principle is unacceptable and should not actually be on the code and really seems out of step with almost everything else that's on the code where we want to let the debate decide these disagreements and explore them openly um, acknowledging fallibility, using charity, all that kind of stuff. Um, I have a couple more things to say about this, but I just want to check in since I've got Cat in the chat. Uh, how did how's this going? Any questions about what I was throwing down there? Not at the moment. Okay, cool. That was pretty clear. Awesome. Good to hear it. Wonderful. Um, so what I'm going to use a little bit of charity now on behalf of the acceptability principle. Why might Edward Damer, who's a otherwise you know intelligent philosopher, think that this is a good principle to have on the list? And the best that I've been able to come up with here uh, to defend it is the idea that uh, is a practical argument. So I've served on some uh, boards and leadership teams and community projects and stuff like that. And if you've ever had this experience, too, of, of like serving in a role like that, then maybe you know what I'm talking about. But sometimes there's like that one person in the room that we're like trying to do this like problem solving, discernment work with, and someone's just like lobbing in these like wrenches in the gears of like what about this proposal like way out there and you're just like Ugh, like do we have to talk about that like that doesn't seem to be a very viable option like we've got all these other much better proposals on the table let's deal with those right rather than getting sidetracked um, with these out there proposals um, that don't meet things like the criteria of acceptability I mean there's a reason why even if in philosophy we are always interested in rethinking even really basic assumptions that seem obvious, why that's not allowed in the courtroom. There's a law against doing philosophy in the court. <laughs> um, that it might be like, it's not like we need to 
give arguments about Descartes' evil demon to figure out if someone ran the stoplight or not. Like, maybe we're all in the Matrix. And it's like, no, we don't. That's not this isn't the time to have that kind of conversation. It's not relevant to what we're doing here um, in a courtroom. Um, so sometimes I think if you're if you're in a situation, I'll just be direct and explicit about this. I think the argument can be made that if you're in a situation where you're really under the gun uh, to like make a decision, there's some pragmatic pressures about like only have so much time for this meeting, um, or we need to make a decision by a certain time, that it makes sense, and this is not straight accept acceptability principle, but might give it this bone. It might make sense to prioritize the conversation around those options, positions, or proposals that do meet this criteria of acceptability before we start exploring the ones that don't. Like kind of going for the low-hanging fruit here first before we start going drifting out into the more wild options. Um, but even there, I'm like, there can definitely be exception cases where um, a radical departure from how we would normally deal with something may be the right answer, and we need to be thinking about that possibility too. Definitely in my leadership work, the leadership roles that I play, I think this is an important feature of a good leader, to not just like always keep the status quo going, but being like, are we, are we missing something? Is there some like big way in which we need to grow or evolve as a community um, that's very different from what we've done before? At least tracking that possibility and having some room for it, I, I still think is valuable. But, but I, I think this is my best shot about trying to understand what would be the appeal to something like the acceptability principle. It might just be a pragmatic thing. Certainly for if, if this was like a philosophy class, other than like the nuts and bolts kind of thing that we're doing with critical reasoning, if this is like one of my 101 classes or my ethics classes, in the philosophy classroom, I don't think the acceptability principle is appropriate because the, the practical pressures are different. When we're doing like big picture philosophy, we're trying to think about things, all things considered, right? There's, we've been working on these philosophical problems for thousands of years, and we're gonna keep working on them for thousands of years. And it isn't like we need to figure this thing out right now. Like we want to get it right, and um, and sometimes that can be, especially in ethics, there can be urgency about some stuff, about changing our perspectives on things because in the absence of those changes great injustices could be going on and so there can be some urgency about that too um, but but those are that's my that's my best effort at trying to make sense of the acceptability principle if it has usefulness I think it has very limited usefulness okay we got two more principles and they can be done together uh, so let's let's go back to the list here these are the suspension of judgment principle and the resolution principle and they really amount to the same thing. I mean, there's a lot of words here, uh, but it's these are the two principles for how we dismount from the debate. So remember I was saying the fallibility principle, truth-seeking principle, they're about how we approach the debate, our kind of attitude going into that. And then we've got these eight principles we just finished up that are about governing our behavior while we're at the table of the debate. And then these last two are about how we go on, we leave this debate and go on to the rest of our lives. And the, the sort of bottom line proposal here by both of these principles is that at the end of the debate, take stock of what's happened and see like how the chip's fallen. <clears throat> and if there's a position that is clearly, given the arguments that have been put on the table, the rationally most defensible position, then that's what you should believe. So if you started the debate with that belief, keep it. If you didn't start the debate with that belief, change to adopting it. If the situation is one where there hasn't been a clear rational consensus over what's the most rationally defensible position, then you need to suspend judgment. And this means kind of like being agnostic, like not endorsing one way or the other, but being open, like basically saying this is still an unresolved matter and we don't have the grounds for confidence and conviction on one thing versus another. Okay. Um, so if you came in with some confidence about something, now you need to suspend it. Not necessarily abandon it immediately, but, but to uh, say this is, I, I recognize that for me, to, the, the dream of having a position that is defensible here, it's been able to demonstrate that it is the most rationally defensible position, and so that justifies your confidence and conviction. That has not happened, and so I wouldn't yet be justified in having that confidence and conviction. So it's kind of, uh, I could maybe describe it with this model. 
You take stock at the end of the debate and then basically readjust your personal belief set to match or reflect the outcome of the debate. That's what it's really saying in so many words. Um, so I've got some problems with this one too. Um, so I have some suggestions for how to modify this. Um, I think there's some blind spots here with what this recommendation has going on. The general spirit of it, I got no problems with at all because the reason why these principles are on the code is basically out of respect for the truth. That it's like, it's saying, in short, like take the outcome of the debate seriously, like sincerely. If I came into a debate with a position, we get into uh, the arguments about it, and you've been able to throw some massive objections at it that I can't deal with. And you've said, and you don't even have to do that because here's this other option that has so much better arguments for it. Then for me to be like, cool, well, thanks for the discussion. I'm just going to go back into my life doing things exactly the same way that I did them before and pretend like that never happened. That would be pretty insincere. So that there, there's some way in which I need to be rationally responsive to what has happened in a debate. I mean, otherwise, what's the point? As um, Aristotle says in his ethics, Nicomachean ethics, he says, we want to know what is good so that we can live it. If the whole point here of open critical debate is to have rational consideration tell us what we ought to believe, if then we don't execute on that, then what's the point of it, right? So I, I like that. I think that's absolutely appropriate. And whatever we're going to put in for the intellectual virtues that inform how we leave a debate, the spirit of that needs to be captured. My problems are just that I think the suspension of judgment principle and the resolution principle as stated on the code have far too narrow of uh, imagination for what that kind of sincere response to the outcome of a debate could look like. So, um, and I think it, it misunderstand. it's potentially harmful too to operate this way or to set expectations with the principles as they're stated. I think it's misunderstanding some things about human nature and human psychology and our rational natures. And I'll, I'll try to demonstrate this for you. So, um, first point is just we're not completely rational. <laughs> That's just a, the state of affairs of being a human being. We have capacities to engage in reasoning um, and to entertain rational arguments and apply standards of logic and all this kind of stuff. Like this is part of the robustness of our cognitive life. And there are parts of us um, that in our psychology that are not responsive to reasons that play by different rules. And I'm just going to call those for the sake of uh, convenience here, like what's psychological. Um, you could throw a lot of the emotional in here too. So kind of going back to the treatment of emotions that I was talking about earlier, um, there, there are those ways in which emotions exert a biasing effect in a way that they affect our belief formation in a way that's not responsive to reason and evidence. And that would be part of the concern here too. So there's, there's parts of how we operate or how we function that are responsive to rational considerations. And there's parts of us that play by different rules, really causal rules. Um, there, there's some things that I'm saying here that are slightly controversial, but um, I don't think too controversial. But there, there could be some debate about this for sure, definitely in the realm of moral psychology. Um, but the, the way I see it, here, I'm going to turn my hat here a little bit. Um, reason ha operates at light speed. It can just like pew, move really far away from wherever you're actually at. So how you feel about things, what your life experience is like, what you believe, what you have convictions about, what you value. Reason allows us to entertain and imagine, at least in part, not perfectly, but at least in part, we're able to entertain things that are very foreign to us or not kind of where we occupy on the map, right? I can, I can have, like say, um, when I first was studying Buddhism, you know, I'm not in a Buddhist culture, I'm not in a Buddhist family, um, I don't have many other Buddhists around me to talk to, um, I'm not able to just like get enculturated into it. I'm reading about it in books, and I'm reading like ancient Buddhist texts, and I'm reading contemporary commentaries and things like that. But early on, all I've got to work with is my rational imagination. Like, Buddhists believe this, and they believe this, and I can like start to form a picture about a set of values and beliefs and an entire perspective that is not the one that I currently have that's pretty far away. And so I like to imagine it as like <clears throat> reason runs ahead. 
and is like, ooh, 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 look at this cool thing. Like, th this might have something to it, right? I, I got arguments in, on behalf of Buddhist principles, and I was like, those are really compelling. Like, that makes so much sense, right? There's a logic to it that I can grasp, even when I haven't been, like, deeply soaked in it, right? I haven't been enculturated into it. So reason has this kind of power, like zoom ahead and look at things and, and entertain them and, you know, look at them from all angles and stuff like that. But the rest of us is much slower. The rest of our psychology or our character, the emotional aspects of us, they're much slower to change. They're kind of like lingering behind and being like, oh, that's so far away. Like, I they kind of don't want to change. There's resistance to change, right? Um, it's going to take, it's not like as soon as I think of a way that I want to be, that I become that thing. Like, um, like when you have an aspirational self, like let's say you reflect and you recognize, oh, I got this part of my character that I'm not too pleased with. Um, this happened to me, uh, well, some, uh, yeah, my story is sort of weird. Yeah, I may not be the best anecdotal example here, but, um, well, okay, I'll just <laughs> lay out what's happening for me. Um. When I was uh, about a junior in high school, I was uh, very, very arrogant at this point in my life. I was very lonely, depressed, despairing, um, intelligent, and elitist, and would not suffer fools and things like this, right? I had, and I had a very inflated sense of my own abilities, too. I would go after my teachers, and I could beat them in arguments, and I made my Catholic religion teacher cry a bunch of times and it's still a sin that's on my soul that I feel guilt about to this day um, and I've you know apologized to her but um, I, I was just brutal I was like if you can't handle debate then like that's your problem not mine right I was very arrogant and um, and then I had a teacher that didn't even like tell me that I was doing something wrong but just was this kind of walking counter example or, or objection to my way of living. And this is where I got into a little bit of Buddhism, uh, to uh, hearing some more get to know you stuff, I guess here, I'm getting a little more personal, but, um, I immediately, I had this like rapid transformation where I was like, Oh my gosh, like I'm being so dumb. Like I, if I really cared about all the things I say I care about, I wouldn't be living the way I am. I wouldn't be the person that I am. And for me, there was this kind of like, I got flipped on my ass. It was like this big, massive 180. And uh, it really changed my life very rapidly. And I remember the months after this kind of realization sunk in and that it was just, it was, it was, a, it was a wild time. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of like rapid shiftings inside my psychology, like a huge earthquake, rather than like the slow movement of tectonic plates, you know, shifting. Um, it was like crash. But I know for a lot of other people, it doesn't always work out that way. Like just as soon as you recognize that there's some attribute about yourself that is undesirable or not good, that it doesn't always just like flip on a dime. Um, that's why I was saying like maybe I'm not a good example. That's not a good example because so often it doesn't work that way. And there's other aspects of me that are like that. Um, other aspects of my personality that have been slower to change on things. Um, there, it was slower for me to, uh, I was kind of more of a loner person when I was younger and it was slower for me to like be comfortable and more outgoing. I'm, I'm a natural introvert. I don't know if you can tell now at this point in my life, but growing into extroverted capacities was uh, a much slower process for me. And I, I sort of recognized that they would be valuable for me to have those traits, but those aspects go slow. And, <clears throat> and that's the point that I'm going for here is that it, a lot of times, the rest of us, like, I can rationally recognize something would be better. And it doesn't mean I'm going to change immediately. But it, it might be a slow, slow process of doing that. Um, so uh, when it comes to these principles of the resolution principle and the suspension of judgment principle, the, the fact that they're holding this expectation that, like, as soon as the debate is over, you need to realign all of your beliefs in, in light of that. Like, I just don't think it happens that way for people. And if they have the expectation that they ought to do that, or that expectation is thrust on them by other people, I think that can be damaging. Um, I think it is better to have patience with yourself about this, and not in the sense of like making excuses for beliefs that are you're like, yeah, that was disproven, right? Like, I yeah, I shouldn't subscribe to that position anymore. Um, but to have some patience with how quickly you're going to be able to adapt to that, 
and and having a respect for that and having some patience about it doesn't mean being insincere about responding to the outcome of the debate that that's the big point i'm trying to make right the spirit of these principles that i think is correct is that what happens in a debate is something that needs to be respected somehow what i'm concerned about with these principles is that they don't have as much imagination for what that can look like <clears throat> and it's kind of an unreasonable expectation to just like reorganize your entire psyche just because of a you know maybe an hour long conversation you just had like it just won't happen like that um, and when when people have the expectation, what, another way I can put the concern about it being harmful is like um, <clears throat> if maybe someone else says this to you or maybe it's just those negative self-talk voices in your own head of being like, you know better. Why aren't you doing this? Do you care about the truth at all? Like, what's your problem? Like, you just got disproved. Why are you still so dogmatically, stubbornly hanging on to it, right? And it doesn't, you don't have to be like, I'm not making the adjustment immediately, so I must be totally insincere and not can care about the truth. Maybe caring about the truth is something impossible for people, or maybe at least just for me. And that starts going down a dark path, and I'm like, that's totally unnecessary. It doesn't follow. Um, the expectation shouldn't be that you can just do this immediately, but that you're going to put in the work that's going to move in that direction. That's the recommendation I'd put instead for the resolution principle. And even for suspension of judgment, let's talk about that a little bit. So the other the other part about how I think these principles maybe have a limited imagination of what a sincere response can look like, uh, well, I'll just pantomime it to you. So let's say um, we're hanging out all night. I have done this with my friends before, um, especially back in our college years. You might like stay up all night talking about meaning of life, like got a pack of beers, drink them all, talk into the wee mornings, and then the sun's coming up, and you're like, okay, we've got to stop having this discussion. Um, and let's say I was, um, you know, giving you my theory of the meaning of life or something. And we discuss it and we discuss it and we discuss it. And at the end of the, the next morning, the sun's coming up, right? And I say, um, well, wow, uh, you've given me some pretty big objections. I don't know how to deal with them. Um, kind of like the situation I was describing uh, a while back here today. Um, don't know how to deal with them. But... Uh, if you're right, then like my conception of the meaning of life is totally horseshit and um, is pretty superficial or uh, narrow, myopic, you know, all sorts of different concerns that might be involved with it um, based on false premises, all this kind of stuff. So I'm like, you've given me a lot to think about. Um, I still kind of like, I think the, the, this idea that I had, it's like coming from somewhere, it still feels to me like there's some weight to it. I'm not ready to abandon it just yet. But let me think about it and get back to you. Or even if we don't get the chance to talk in person together, maybe I'm, I'm going to be wrestling with this. But that I need to like switch ponies immediately because you threw some arguments down that I couldn't deal with in the moment is, I think, unreasonable too. Because I can be like, let me, let me process it. And maybe I wasn't able to think of something right now, especially drinking beers all night long or something. Maybe I don't have my full wits about me, or, or even if I did, if we were come stone sober and it was the middle of the day, maybe it's just my imagination didn't go to a place. Like, just because I didn't have the argument to give doesn't mean the arguments aren't out there. So maybe I do some more research and development here, and I come up with something that can meet those objections. To, to spend time doing that, I think, is still respecting the outcome of the debate. I mean, like, not quite ready to give up on this position, let me see if I can deal with these objections, especially if the objections are ones that I've never heard before, right? If, if you're the first person to ever tell these things to me, then maybe I need some more time to process that um, and see whether what you're saying really does follow. Like to, for someone to be like, recant, like immediately, like on the spot, that seems silly to me too. So I think there are these other ways in which I'm, I'm not necessarily changing my position immediately, but... I'm still taking the outcome of the debate seriously, recognizing I got some serious burden of proof. I got some rebuttal principle to deal with here. Oh, did I? I feel like I skipped the rebuttal principle. Oh, no. I'm going to have to come back and talk about that. I think I might have missed the principle. Uh, oops. Uh, okay. But let's finish this one off before I go back to that. Um, all right. So, oh, and this is another point. This is another reason why I chose the the example of, like, we're talking about the meaning of life. If I just spilled my guts and gave you my entire theory of the meaning of life and value and everything, and you had some serious objections and blew it up, um, even if I'm like, wow, I, yeah, I accept that criticism, 
I, I, yeah, this is, I got some serious work cut out for me here. For me to just like rip all of those things out of me immediately and reorganize myself is also, I think, can be very psychologically damaging um, and even, I might say, traumatic. Or to think that I need to be doing that and try to push myself to do that um, can be a concern too. Because if we're talking about anything that really matters, like I said before with the coat example, our beliefs and values, the deep ones, are the things that keep us warm. They, they make us functionally uh, empowered. And if those are just going to be ripped away, I need to have something to replace them. And that might take time. Right? Maybe in a debate, all you've been able to do is show me that I'm, I do not have a good position here. There's some serious concerns about it in terms of its rational defense, and it's unacceptable. But I am still going to have to figure out, okay, well, in the meantime, I'm going to have to still use this until I can come up with something that is better, that doesn't have those problems. Um, or even if you've been able to present a position to me that is, that is demonstrated as being better, um, it might take some time for me to grow into adopting that because the rest of my psychology not moving as fast as my rationality. Um, that, that, that's a training process that will happen. Um, so for all those reasons, I think it's, um, it's more rational and more compassionate, like sort of the ethical terms on the, co the standards for the Code of Intellectual Conduct, for us to expand the sense uh, of what it means to take the outcome of a debate seriously and sincerely um, from what the code is laying down in its strict rules. So that's my also my my other proposal, big proposal about how to modify the code. Um, so um, I recommend that to you. Okay, uh, how are we doing, Kat? Any any comments, questions about that last chunk? Okay, any input? Awesome. Happy to hear they're helpful. Okay, so I think I did, I think I did skip the rebuttal principle. Let's, uh, uh, bah, bah, bah. yeah, I did. I totally skipped it. Okay. All right, we got to talk about the rebuttal principle. Um, and this one is just awesome, just straight awesome. And I really love the language here. And, and maybe this isn't a bad one to finish up the code on. Like doing it out of order is maybe a little. Um, fortuitous here. Um, so the rebuttal, let me just read it first. The rebuttal principle says, one who presents an argument for or against a position should include in the argument an effective rebuttal to all anticipated serious criticisms of the argument that may be brought against it or against the position it supports. So um, what this is is basically charity part two. Um, it's the follow-through on charity. So the charity principle was all about um, imagining what is going on for my opponents. Like, can I come up with arguments to support them? What's the strongest possible footing that my opponents could be on? And if my opponents are people who disagree with my position or with my thesis that take issue with it, then a lot of those arguments will probably look like objections to my position. Ways in which the, another position is more rationally defensible than, than mine. Um, so charity kind of tills the ground that sets up my ability to fulfill the rebuttal principle. And the, the one way I can put this is that charity without rebuttal is sort of not worth a whole heck of a lot. And I see this a lot sometimes in, in papers from students, um, that especially when they're concerned about like open-mindedness and fairness in the debate and this kind of thing, that I get... Uh, you know, intro stuff, here's my position, here are my arguments to defend it, people that disagree with me say this, the end. So it's like, I'm open-minded, I presented arguments from both sides, you know, but you didn't engage with them, That that's the problem there. Um, and it's not really taking them seriously, it's not enough to just know what your opponents are going to say, but like, what are you going to say to respond to those concerns? That's where the rebuttal principle gets its meaning. It's not just enough to be aware of or sort of cosmopolitan that you know what other people think, but that you, you t like in the sense of respect, that you take them so seriously that you think maybe they're right. And what is that going to say for the things that I'm saying are right or that I'm defending? 
are the things that we should believe. So the rebuttal principle is, is really the, the ultimate follow through on taking your opponent seriously. Uh, now you can't do rebuttal very well without charity. Um, and what we would call that is straw man attacks. So uh, the, re the straw man fallacy is, is a very important one to be tracking. We're going to talk about it a lot at the end of the quarter when we do the fallacies. But uh, let's do a little foreshadowing about it now. Straw man can happen really two ways. Um, one way is, let's say you and I are in a debate, like, like maybe like a presidential debate, like we're up in front of the cameras, right? Um, one way I could be guilty of straw man is if I take what you've said and I twist and distort it into something that's much dumber, something easier to attack um, than what you actually said. So that distortion thing. That's pretty bad, right? I'm not facing off against the strongest possible opponents. I'm going after the weakest ones. And if we really care about truth seeking and we want to be, you know, fallibility, truth seeking principle, all that big picture stuff for the code, I want to test my ideas to see if they're really worth, they deserve my conviction. I can't do that with weak opponents. That's why it's called a straw man. Um, for me to like get into a sword fight with a scarecrow and defeat it doesn't really prove anything about my sword swordsmanship abilities, right? My my skills there. I need to go after a live opponent who's like actually good and then if I can defeat them then I'm really good right? it's a real test that demonstrates that this position is stronger um, without putting up against serious resistance you don't get that right so that's the rational concern with straw man the other way it can happen though too is if I I'm not distorting something you've said or what one of my debate opponents is saying um, but I just bring up weak opponents um, that also makes it look like I'm doing this like, oh, I know about the other side. Um, it's kind of like when students uh, tell me like, oh, you know, when it, when it comes to politics stuff, like, oh, no, I'm, you know, I'm an open-minded person. Like, I watch both CNN and Fox News. And I'm like, hmm, maybe those are not the best representatives of your opponent's position to work with, right? That there are um, other more legitimate versions of how to defend or represent uh, people that are in that camp, right? That a camp that you're not a part of. Um, so, uh, so that also is a straw man fallacy. So, the rebuttal principle, when it's coupled with charity, where you're trying to come up with the strongest, most legitimate shots that your opponent has at defending themselves, they might still ultimately fail as arguments. They might still be objectionable, but they got to be at least the best that that opponent can offer then we really got uh, a rebuttal principle that's worth something. So enacting the rebuttal principle actually has value. So that's key. That's why the code puts it as all anticipated serious criticisms rather than just the really weak ones. So if you took charity and rebuttal, put them together, you've got a big argument against straw man attacks. Okay. The other thing, though, that I really love about um, the rebuttal principle is how it's worded here. I think Edward knocked it out of the park on this one. Because um, the way it's worded is in such a way that it is impossible to ever satisfy. There is no way that you're ever going to be able to say, I checked my box on the rebuttal principle. You need to have an effective rebuttal to all anticipated serious criticisms of your position or the arguments that you're using to support it. That is a huge task. That's a superhuman task. And no one can ever do that. And, and so I like this because I think that's the right attitude with which to look at the entire code. In fact, I wish all the other principles were kind of reworded into language that gave that suggestion to it. I, I don't think that what the code of intellectual conduct is, is a you must be this tall to ride this ride kind of thing. That like, here are the basic conditions before you can acceptably be a part of the debate. The, I, I mentioned before, I think, um, this idea that I, my observation of human nature and human history is that every time humans have come up with something like really beautiful or really valuable or really insightful, someone immediately is like, hmm, can I use this as a weapon to beat someone over the head with? We do this with logic and rationality. We do this with ethics. We do this with religion, we do this with art, we do this with everything. Like we take things that are pure and good and true and turn them into abusive weapons. I actually, I'll share one little anecdotal story. When I first started teaching at Bellevue College, um, this was this was maybe my third quarter in. 
so it was a few years back. Um, I had a student who was really excited about taking philosophy and even met with me outside of class before we even had the first class. He sent me an email the week before and wanted to talk and meet and stuff. And then throughout the whole first week when I was doing the Code of Intellectual Conduct, they were talking to me after classes and stuff like that. And I was like, this is great. This student's going to be awesome. And, and after we finished up the code, they raised their hand in class. And I'm like, yep. And they go, um, I love this code. This code is like brilliant and awesome. This is everything I've always wanted, uh, articulated really clearly. Um, and what's really cool about it is that if someone violates the principles on the code, we can basically tell them to shut up. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, have you been paying attention? Like, that's not the spirit of the code at all. Um, not this cooperative, collaborative, truth-seeking thing that we do with our opponents, right? Um, this isn't... Uh, it's not like the code gives you the mechanisms to tell people to shut the fuck up or to like leave the debate or something like that. That's not its purpose or intended function. I like to frame it like this. Think back to those uh, first two standards on the code, right? The the procedural principle and the ethical, uh, or the procedural standard and the ethical standard. Instead of it being a this tall to ride this ride, and if you don't match up, then GTFO, um, then it's really something more like, uh, if you care about these objectives, if you care about getting at the truth and treating each other and ourselves ethically, the more that you can follow these principles, the more success you'll have. So are we going to follow these principles perfectly? Nope. We're humans. We make mistakes. That's a little Lutheran in me talking. We're all, we're all sinners. <laughs> we all make, we're not perfect people. Um, we're neither entirely saint nor sinner. Um, we're not completely evil and we're not completely good. And even when we try, even when we have certain values that we respect, we oftentimes don't, our behavior doesn't match up with those things. So this is a little less important for our class where we're not getting into like big hairy debates with each other and class sessions or something like that. Uh, but I think the sentiment is still a good one to share that they need to have some understanding. This is a initial uh, investment of goodwill to like, have this as the objective to say I'm going to try to follow these principles but we never do it perfectly and it's not a deal breaker it's like if you can't follow these principles then you can't have the discussion at all or something but it's like the code's just it's a warning it's like the extent to which you can't do these things is the extent to which your chances of having a productive conversation that also is respectful and ethically ideal diminishes so I, I like it that way that like with the rebuttal principle being worded as something that's impossible to satisfy, it means we never get to be like, pat ourselves on the back and be like, check, check, check. Like, I know what I'm doing here. I've got it all figured out. I don't have to worry about this anymore. It's like you always have to worry about it. There's always room for improvement. And there's payoff for improving in that. Um, so I like that. That's not a bad way to end the code, too, of like a reframing of everything that it's uh, proposing and, and recommending to us in terms of our behavior. So that's the code of intellectual conduct. Um, it's been very helpful to me personally over my uh, life and to my teaching and framing up philosophy and uh, to many people I've talked to. I don't need to make this into a big testimonial thing. The gospel of the of the code of intellectual conduct or something like that. But um, I would want to encourage you to consider using it in your life beyond just things like academic discussion or classrooms or something like that. Some of the biggest payoffs I've gotten from uh, incorporating these principles and these intellectual virtues into my own actions uh, is just in interpersonal relationships and how we communicate. Communication is so essential. And sometimes when we've got disagreements and to explore those, I've mentioned before how I think this space of cooperative truth seeking is one that can build intimacy and build trust and deepen relationships. And I, I definitely think that's true. So. Um, hope this has been useful and interesting to you. Cat, uh, any questions about the whole code? You're the only person in the chat today uh, to be a representative for the class. Is there is there anything you'd like to ask about or that you're curious about um, that you'd like me to say some some more things about? That's fair. Nothing coming to you. That's it's understandable. Something will pop up later. Yeah, I'm sure too. 
And and for everyone who's watching this on YouTube later, like I was encouraging in the last video, like start some discussion threads on the Canvas site. Feel free to throw your thoughts up there and share them with with everyone and with me, and uh, we can talk about it a little bit more. I'd love to do that. It's it's so sad to me that we don't we don't get to talk about all this stuff in person together. Where you can just ask questions right on the fly. Um, but I it's when I've taught this over many years, I get this response from students very frequently. Where they're like. There's a, there's a lot of download. Like, there's a lot. I'm going to have to chew on this for a while, and then and then maybe I'll have some other things to say or ask. So um, definitely this is not the last opportunity for us to talk about it. Um, like I've mentioned before, moving on with the rest of the quarter's material, we're not going to be in the kind of space, uh, logical space that we are in talking about things like the Code of Intellectual Conduct. But I like it as a big picture framing device that I encourage you to kind of keep on the back burner. We're not always going to be talking about all this humanistic stuff about us getting into debates and exploring the truth. We'll be looking at real like nuts and bolts of arguments and logic and concepts and principles and things like that. Um, but keeping this on the back burner is like this sets the context for why developing these skills matters or what's useful for them or what we should use those tools for. I, I think that's useful and important. And maybe um, maybe some more thoughts will come up as, as we keep going and, and share them with me. I always want to keep this class... Uh, and its material as human as possible, that it is not just dry analytic standards here, but they have an impact on how we relate to each other and how we understand ourselves and how we understand disagreement and all this good stuff. So we'll probably take some more tangents like this from time to time, but it isn't the focus of the class to do. We're not. It's not. All the other weeks of the quarter aren't going to be like this one. Um, okay, uh, uh, the video is at an hour and forty minutes. And because of some delays and technical difficulties, we got we got delayed a little bit, you and me, Kat. So I'm thinking about calling it here. I I'm, was thinking about starting in with the Chapter 2 material, but maybe I'll leave that for another video. Um, this is still a lot of, of thoughts and ideas and stuff, so um, maybe this is good. Okay, I think I'll do that. I need to give a code word um, or phrase. How about, because uh, I had that coughing attack earlier, how about frog in my throat? Frog in my throat, that's the code word. Just plop that into the, the um, quiz. Oh, I wanted to say some things, some uh, structural things um, about the class. Uh, so I was coming up with some conversations with other students. Um, so I know with the online, a completely online format for the class, Things are a little different, and a lot of times students take online classes because of having schedules that don't permit or allow for taking classes on campus. And sometimes that also means that the way in which you take the class is um, going to have to look a little differently. I try to um, design the structure of this class to emulate an on-campus class as much as possible for some important reasons. One of them being that um, I've seen online classes before where it's like, everything is out there and you just kind of work at it your own pace. It's like you're working through the book at your own rate and you might not do work for a long time and then do a bunch of work and then you know kind of that bingey thing I've talked about before. And I don't think it works in this class, um, especially during summer quarter where everything's smashed and abbreviated, um, that regular practice is really important. It's not just a matter of like, oh I hear about this idea, I understand it. It takes some absorbing so I want, I'm trying to structure it, just to put my cards on the table, in a way that requires regular uh, checking in with the class, basically, over the course of a week. Um, so that's why I've got like regular class schedules, and we've broken, broken them up and stuff like that. If that doesn't work for your schedule, though, let's talk about it. I want to find solutions for how this class can work for you. And one of the things I'm going to be doing, um, just for everybody, um, just want to kind of make an announcement about it, is I'm, I'm setting up all of the video code quizzes to have due dates, but they don't have lock dates on Canvas. So it's not like if you don't get it in by the due date, then you're not going to be able to submit it at all. So if it, if, if it comes after the due date, you'll still be able to submit it. It'll be flagged to me as late in the gradebook, so I'll know about that. But um, if that's what you have to do to make things work, that's that's okay with me. That's not a big, that's not skin off my teeth. Um, and I'm not going to make you have to like ask for permission every time you want to do something like that. Um, this is college. I respect you as an adult. 
who can manage your own time and what you need to do. But I will put in my recommendation here that in my experience teaching this class, this isn't the class that you can just study last minute for and, and perform well on. It takes repeated practice and it takes absorbing this stuff over time. This class can be a fairly challenging one in terms of its subject matter. It's not all super straightforward stuff. Um, and like I've said before in the welcome video, it, just having the intellectual understanding is insufficient. It also takes the practice, um, the executing on that intellectual understanding, right? Like understanding the principle and then figuring out how to wield it in analysis is a is a whole nother ball game. So. Um, regular contribution or setting aside time on a regular basis throughout the week to invest in this class and work on its material is my recommendation. Um, but you've got the text and you've got my lecture notes are all up on Canvas. You have all the homework assignments. If you want to kind of be working ahead a little bit, you can do that on your own. Um, these videos, though, the video lectures will be happening sequentially as we go. I do have old videos that uh, from when I taught um, this class online before that you can watch on YouTube, but uh, I do recommend waiting for the new ones. I, you know, I'm I'm not that teacher who it just has the class canned and just runs it every time, and then I don't really have to do anything. Um, I like taking the effort to give these lectures fresh every time I've got the class, even though it's a lot more time. One, it allows me the space to be responsive to where students are at, to like be live in the chat and ask questions. And as I talk to you outside of class, I can build that in to inform how I go after things this time, giving those lectures, uh, and adapt them and improve them. I, I get better at lecturing, I think. So I think these lectures will be better than the ones that I have posted from before. Um, I taught that class in 2016, so it's been a little while. That online class that's on my YouTube page. Um, but if in an emergency, that's available too, but uh, not not recommended. So um, hopefully um, these these recommendations are things that uh, you'll respect in as much as you have the ability for it. And if you don't, um, talk to me about it and 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 maybe do the whole asking permission rather than asking forgiveness kind of thing. Um, I would like to be a part of doing anything off what I'm recommending um, and helping you brainstorm and get creative about what will work and finding solutions for that. Um, yeah, but to just kind of take this class on autopilot with no space for us to relate or talk to each other or be responsive to each other is not ideal, I think. Um, and don't So don't treat the class kind of like a workbook or something like that. Um, okay, so I think those are all the things I wanted to say. I gave you the code word. I think we're good. So I will bid you adieu. Uh, I don't think we're going to need to do a supplementary video lecture this weekend. Um, I think we'll just plan on, on um, getting into the Chapter 2 material next week, uh, and that'll be good. Um, so I will be giving another video lecture from 12.30 to 2.30 on Tuesday, and hopefully I'll be able to see you there. Uh, I hope you're having a good 4th of July, and uh, you have a good weekend. And if you have any questions about the code, the setup for this class, what you need to be doing next, let me know about that. I will be sending an announcement um, maybe tonight, more likely tomorrow. Um, yeah, probably tomorrow uh, with my weekend update email that kind of tells you what we're going to be doing over the next week. So that'll be that. I'll see you then. Goodbye.